time. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, we're awake in the front. All right. Hopefully, as you came in, you grabbed a bulletin so you can see what's going on in the life of the church. Uh, just a quick reminder, we want to remind you of uh, the work day. It's really big in the bulletin, so hopefully everybody could see it and know when it is. Okay, work day Saturday, October 7th. We're going to come and do some just general cleaning and fixing up and painting around the church, some good things that we need. Um, so be here October 7th. It's also the same day as men's breakfast. So men, if, if you want to come to a, a prayer meeting, Bible study, come that morning. Am I the one popping? Nope. Okay. Come that morning, uh, and we'll have breakfast, and then we'll do work day. Can you tell we're trying to bribe you, right, with some food? Hey, come eat breakfast, and then, hey, let's go to work. Hopefully it'll work, right? I don't, I don't want to do work day by myself, so please show up to work day. Other than that, there's other things going on in the life of the church. If you look on this other page, you'll see all the other dates and meetings. Get a bulletin so you know what's going on because the church is still alive. Amen? All right, we're going to start worship service off with meeting and greeting. If you see someone new or someone you haven't seen in a while today, uh, shake their hand and tell them how happy you are to see them in the house of the Lord. As you make your way back to your seats, we're going to continue our service with tithes and offerings. And if the best ushers ever would come forward, all right, all right, you guys ready? All right, we're going to pray, and then you guys can take up our offering, all right? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. I pray that you would bless this offering that we're about to take up, that you would use it, Lord, to reach our community, to reach the lost that are right outside our doors that you would bless the gift and the giver. It's in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
all stand with us, and we're going to continue worshiping in song.
the band kind of makes their way down, we're going to enter into our family altar prayer time. You guys can sit, stand, kneel. You can come forward, stand, or kneel, whatever feels natural to you. But at this time, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And I encourage you to leave whatever you carried in with you at his feet. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for another day in your house. And Lord, I pray that whatever we walked in the doors with, that you would take care of them, that we would lay them down at your feet, knowing that you are all-powerful, knowing that you can handle anything. There's nothing too big and there's nothing too small, that you can take whatever it is and you can cast it away. Lord, I pray that we lay those things down at your feet now so that our minds and our hearts can be quiet, can be clear, can be ready for what you have to say to us. So that when you speak, we are moved. Father, we pray for our family members who are sick. Lord, we lift up Miss Lorraine to you. And Lord, I pray your healing hands and your healing spirit be upon her and all around her. That you would take the cancer within her body and you would cast it away just as you cast away our sin. And Lord, that you would heal her. We're praying for your will to be done in her life. Father, for those that are traveling today, give them travel mercy. And Father, as we sit here in this room and we await your word, I pray that our hearts would be open and receptive and ready to move, ready to be faithfully obedient to you, Lord, as you call us, even today, that we would be ready to go, that nothing would hold us back. That's our prayer today, Lord. And Lord, for those that came forward you know what's on their hearts and minds, and I pray your hands be upon their life and that whatever it is they brought to you, you would take it away. And in its place, put your spirit, put your trust, put your faithfulness, your loving kindness, your Holy Spirit upon them, Lord, so that they may know you've got this. Father, I pray your spirit be on us today as we transition from prayer to message. I pray, Lord, I pray your spirit would speak to us today. Wake us up. Remind us who you are. Remind us who we are. We are your sons and daughters. Remind us today, Lord. It's in your name we pray. In Jesus' heavenly name we pray. Amen. In the tapestry of time, a story unfolds of a faithful God whose love is forever endless. Through the lowest valleys and the highest mountains, his steadfast presence is always with us. In every trial and every test we face, he holds us close in his unchanging love. When shadows of doubt gather around us, his faithfulness shines as a brilliant sunrise. With arms stretched out, he guides our way, a beacon of hope in the darkest day. In every moment, his promises hold true. He paints the sky with hues of dawn, reminding us that we're never alone. Through every season, in joy or strife, God's faithfulness is the anchor of life. So let us trust in his unwavering hand as we journey through this shifting land. For in his love, we find our peace he is always and forever faithful. Amen. We serve a faithful God. Good morning. Well, we're all awake. That's good. That's step one. But it is a good day. As always, it's a good day to have a great day. And it's my honor to bring you the word of the Lord today. We're going to pick up a series that we kind of put on pause. We're picking up our series on heroes of faith. 
And to kind of give you a quick recap, since it's, it's been a minute, uh, so far we've talked about King David, Samson, Paul, and Ruth, heroes of the faith. We're reminded by their stories to have humble and faith-filled eyes. We're reminded that our feelings can lead us astray. We're reminded that God can use anyone, even the villain. And we were reminded to be ambassadors of hope, bringing hope to the hopeless. Today, our hero is Noah. And as we travel through Noah's story, I pray that God would remind us of something else, something new, maybe something we've forgotten. But Noah and the Ark is one of those, those stories that most folks know, right? It was one of those stories you heard as a kid. You know, Noah built an ark, a big boat, right? It saved humanity. When you hear it as a kid, it's a great story. But as an adult, when you dive into it, it's kind of scary. So today we're going to dive into his story. And we're going to see what God has to remind us of today. So we're going to start our journey in Genesis chapter 6 verses 9 through 16, and if you don't have your Bibles, it will be on the screens up front, but if you would, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is Genesis 6, 9 through 16. It says this, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah, oh, to be named Ham, right? <laughs> Verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all of this, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy them both. So make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below a roof and an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make to make it lower in the middle upper decks. These are the instructions God gave Noah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Pray that his story would move us, would remind us of something today. And as we remember those things, may we live it out in our own story. Father, speak for your servants are listening. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Have you guys ever been asked to do something that didn't make any sense at all? As kids, I remember being asked all the time to do something that just didn't make sense at all. Uh, I, I remember one, one family get-together, a reunion, if you will, where all my uncles got together and they thought, hey, these kids are being too rowdy, well, let's ask them for some help. So they got all the cousins together, there's five of us, and we're, all, we're all boys and one girl. But he asked all the boys. He said, I need all the boys to come here and help me with something. We said, okay, fine. We were playing football. We are like, but what do you need? He said, I need you to help me find the snipe. I said, what are you talking about? And so he began to explain to us what to do. He actually said, hey, we, we just need you to go around in the backyard and start clapping your hands. And as you walk around in the backyard clapping your hands, someone's going to hold a bag. And when you see the snipe, you just keep clapping. And he'll jump in should have known that didn't make any sense right like something is wrong but no we, me and my cousins we, we were raised by southern folk and we knew not to question we knew to just do as told so we went and we we started clapping in the backyard there's five of us boys back there just clapping walking around and as my uncle sat on the back porch chuckling the whole time, they watched us walk around the backyard, clapping our hands, holding, holding a garbage bag, hoping a snipe would jump in. Man, and, and you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to think we were smart enough to know better, but they did it at least two more family reunions in a row before we figured it out. We were like, wait a minute, 
This doesn't make any sense. There is no such thing. Like, what do you, t- what do you got us doing here? We finally figured it out. But it didn't make any sense, but we did it anyways because we were told to. As I thought about that story with my uncles, I thought about Noah and God, how God caused him to do something that doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make sense. And yet Noah does it anyways. God says, no, I want you to build a boat, but I want you to build it really far from any water. No water around, just build it. Uh, Okay, okay, okay. Not only do I want you to build a boat, I want you to build a boat with no sails. Okay. Sure, sure, that's fine. Not only do I want you to build a boat, but I want you to build one with no steering wheel, no rudder. Okay. Okay, that's that's weird, God, but we'll, we'll build a boat with no sails, no rudder, no way of steering it. Not only that, I want you to build a boat that is huge, right? This boat would have been massive. This boat would have been like a wooden cruise ship for them, right? I want you to build that by hand. And he just goes, okay. As I, as I looked into the story of Noah, scholars kind of debate on how long it took them. Some say 75 years. Some say 120 years. Either way, this boat didn't get built in a day. It took a long time to build. And Noah just goes, okay, I'll build the boat. I mean, look at this thing. You imagine building that by hand, all of it, out of wood. Crazy, right? It probably would have taken me longer than 120 years to get that done. That's a big boat. And Noah just goes, okay. And he follows God's instructions. And for years, maybe 120 years, he built this boat. And I think there's two reasons why Noah built the boat and didn't ask questions. He just followed God's instructions. One is, I think, because Noah was brought up that way, right? He comes from the line of Enoch. We know Enoch from Genesis. Do you guys know what happened to Enoch? We are told that he walked with God, and then God took him home. He was so close to him that God took him home, took him with him, spared him, didn't even have to experience death. He knew how to walk with the Lord, and I kind of have to think that that was passed down to Noah. He knew how to walk with the Lord. He knew better than to ask questions, just like I did when we were snipe hunting, because you didn't ask questions, you just did as you were told, right? He was brought up that way. And two, he had faithful, radical obedience. Noah had true faith in God, a faith that required radical obedience. This is what I kind of want to focus on today is faithful obedience. Because when we're given instructions, you need faithful obedience in order to follow them. Um, Some of you are new and some of you are not new and you've been here a long time, but we've recently got new tables out there, right? Those white, I, I think they're called buffet cabinets. Might get the terms wrong, but they're brand new. And when we picked them out online, they looked great online. They were put together online. <laughs> One piece. So we ordered those, those beautiful white cabinets, and they came in this box, and we opened it up, and we got to see all 500 pieces of this beautiful cabinet. And the first page, the instructions always, you know, said some assembly required. And I kept saying, you think? Like, there's not even a table here. It took so long, it it took longer than it should have to put that first table together. We open the instructions and they just don't make sense, guys. Like, you're building a table, right? And you think, well, okay, we'll start with the bottom and work our way up. Nope, instructions said, start in the middle. Build the middle first. I was like, what? So we built the middle. And then it said, flip it around and put the top on. I was like, what about the bottom? Nope, then you got to put the back on. We're like, what is going on? Like, it just didn't make any sense at all. I began to have flashbacks of, of, of Barbie's dream house <laughs> from five, ten years ago that I had to put together. I was, I was having PTS moments about putting this thing together with Barbie's dream house. I was like, this is all over again. Where does this piece go? 
I don't even know. There's a jar in my office of leftovers. <laughs> I don't know where they go. But I kept them just in case, just because we need them for a few I don't know, may need to fix it. Might fall apart. But when me and Jen, Pastor Jenny helped me put this first one together, we, we would do things, and we'd put it all together, and then it'd be like, nope, you're supposed to do this first. We're like, wait, what? We, no, no, we don't do that first, and we just keep going. And they're like, nope, we had to take it apart and then put it back together and then take it apart because we kept skipping steps. We kept missing things. It took like four hours to get that thing together, and the instructions was like, oh, you can put it together in 30 minutes. It was like, I don't know who's putting this thing together in 30 minutes, but it ain't me. So we had to backtrack to steps we had missed and just keep plugging away at the instructions until we got those nice white tables out front. And it only happened because we followed the instructions. Noah had such faith in God that he followed his instructions and he didn't deviate. He didn't go, you know what? We might need a steering wheel. We might need a rudder. We'll just add one in. That can't be too hard, right? No, he did exactly as God instructed him to. He followed the blueprint. He didn't start skipping steps. He just built the boat. Sometimes as I look out at our church, not particularly this church, but the church in America. Sometimes I think we haven't been faithfully following the instruction. Sometimes I think maybe we need to take a couple steps back in that instruction bullet and, and go at it again, right? We missed a couple steps somewhere. We need faithful obedience to follow the instructions, the blueprint. To have faithful obedience means you got to have trust. Trust in the one who gave you the instructions and follow those instructions, good or bad. It means you trust whoever gave you those instructions that there's going to be good days and there's going to be bad days and you still got to follow the instructions. During the highs and the lows, it means you don't skip steps when you don't feel like doing them. It means you just follow him. Noah followed God's plan even when it was a bad day. I mean, could you imagine? God has asked you to build a boat miles, hundreds of miles from any water. Can you imagine what the town folk would have been saying? Hey, it's crazy Noah building his boat in the desert. Like, he probably had some bad days. He was probably the talk of the town, and yet he didn't stop building the boat. He just kept going. He kept building. We all read the story of Noah and the ark and how he built the boat, but there's so much more to this story, and I think we miss one key detail, and that's Noah didn't have Home Depot. There was no place to order two-by-fours or plywood or anything from that. He didn't order it and show up, and he just put it together like we did with our cabinets. Noah had to go out into the forest. He had to cut down trees. He had to mill them. He had to debark them. He had to dry them out. And then he could use them to build a boat. After I read that, I began to dig in, and I saw that picture of the Creation Museum, right? On their website. This is what it says on their website. They say that they built an exact replica, right? They followed the instructions. They said that the ark required them to get 3.1 million board feet of timber. 3.1 million board feet of timber. No wonder it took him 120 years to build this boat. You imagine cutting down that many trees? That's insane. And more than 1.2 million board feet of square timbers were needed just for the frame to build the skeleton of this boat. That is a lot of wood. That's a lot of trees to cut down. That's a lot of timber to dry out. He did it all with his family. There was no Home Depot for Noah to go to. It probably would have been a lifesaver if he could. But he had to do it all by hand. And he faithfully did so. 
He did everything, even the small things. We, we, we miss that small detail sometimes when we read the story. And we just go, the story says, oh, and Noah built the boat. Oh, yeah, he built the boat. But where did he get the wood? He had to do the small things of cutting down the trees and milling them and debark them. He didn't skip any steps. Because you imagine if he skipped a couple steps and some of that wood rotted, some of that wood failed. I mean, you know what happens to boats that have holes, right? They don't float too well. In order for the boat to be as God wanted it to be, he couldn't skip steps. If he was going to save humanity, he had to build it to God's instructions. If he was going to save all those creatures, he had to build it according to instructions. That's another thing. When when God was giving Noah all these instructions, he said, no, I want you to build a boat. Noah's like, okay, fine. I want you to build a big boat. Okay, fine. I want you to get two of every animal. I'd have been like, wait, 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 wait. You want to do what? You want me to get in the boat with all these things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no way. He was okay with all of it. And he did it. He just followed the instru- <clears throat> the instructions. So like I swallowed a bug. He was faithful to the blueprints God had given him. He was even faithful in the small things. So naturally, he was faithful in the big things. And that's what we must remember. We must be faithful in the small things. My football coach used to say it like this. He used to tell me that if you want to play in the game, you've got to practice at practice. You've got to be at practice to play in the game. If you don't practice, you ain't in the game. You have to do that. If Noah didn't want to mill the trees, then he wouldn't have built the ark. If you're not willing to be faithful in the small things, then you won't be willing to be faithful in the big things. So what do the small things look like for us today? Any guesses? Some of the small things look like attending church, devotions, prayer, tithing, or or to go one step further. Some of the small things means loving a stranger, sharing a meal with someone, giving them food, eating a meal with a homeless person, showing grace to those who don't deserve your grace, showing grace and mercy to those who have wronged you. These are the little things we're called to do every day. We must be faithful in the little in order to be faithful for the big. There's been times in my life when I wonder why God has called me to do certain things, right? Like, why did you ask me to do this, God? Only to discover that I was a small part in a much larger plan. I'm I'm reminded of first priority. Do you guys know what first priority is? No. Okay, well, I didn't put in my notes to explain it, but let's explain it. Uh, First Priority is a group that's like FCTH at high school. Do you guys know that? Like uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes or FCA or something like that? First Priority was one of those groups. And there was a couple high schools that didn't have any Christian programs in Pensacola. And so uh, at at a youth meeting with other youth pastors from other churches, we decided to start a group called First Priority and use their goals to, to reach some of the teens at the high school. And so we began to have meetings every Thursday. And we would meet, and we would take turns leading, right? It was me and two other pa- youth pastors. And we would take turns leading and organizing the group week by week. And then it was just me and one other pastor. Okay, that's fine. And he began, he began to call out at the last minute, Oh, I have a dentist appointment. I can't, I can't lead this week. Can you do it again? Okay. And then the next week, Hey, I have a staff meeting. I can't meet this week. Can you do this week too? Okay. Oh, we don't we don't have this, and I have to go do this for my family. I can't do this week either. Before long, it had been months, and I was leading the group by myself. And I began to ask God, uh, "This isn't what I signed up for. Where's all the other leaders?" And I began to just want to drop it. Have you ever had something you just didn't want to do anymore? I mean, these were teenagers 
in high school, you can guess how attentive they were, right? How disruptive they can be. How many times I was trying to pray and got hit with a spit wad from somebody. It's just what teens do sometimes. I get it. But being the only person there, the only leader, I couldn't, I couldn't manage kids and lead and do all this other stuff. It was rough, and I just, I just wanted to give up. And so I remember praying to God, and I said, God, I don't want to do this anymore. I'll do this till the end of the year. When this school year's over, I'm done. I'm not coming back to first priority, not if there's no other leader. So I continued on, and I, I did the Thursday group, and I remember the last Thursday of the year, it was in May. And one of the high school kids come up to me and he says, he says I, I'm so glad you, you still hold our group. I don't get to go to church because my parents don't believe in it, so it's nice to come to school and hear it. I believe what you say. Thanks for not giving up on us. It was in that moment that I realized why God had called me to that. It was in that moment that I realized it was part of something much larger. I continued to do that group for three more years by myself until I left that church. The small things that get us down, that aggravate us, that makes us just want to give up are sometimes the things we're supposed to be doing. Sometimes those are the small things that God needs us to do so that the bigger picture can play out. I'll never forget that kid's testimony. Thank you for not giving up on me. It reminded me of Galatians 6, 9. It says this. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Faithful, obedient, means we don't give up. You keep doing those things. Even when you don't feel like it, you keep doing those things because it's part of something bigger. And if you're faithful and obedient, God will be faithful and obedient. Because, I I mean, Noah must have thought to himself at some point during this build, why am I building a boat with no rudder? He didn't sweat the small detail. He just kept persevering. He kept going till the end. We need to be faithfully obedient to God. When he calls, we must answer. We must build the boat. When God says, I need you to do this, we need to go, okay, not well you know that the the tuesdays aren't good god maybe we could do that thursday and we try to like start bargaining with god of when we can do things but god just wants us to do something we must realize that if god has called you to it he'll see you through it oftentimes when god calls us to do something he gives us instructions or he gives us something that he wants us to do we we kind of we have a moses moment right well god i don't i don't speak too well I, you don't, why send me? Well, I'm not the right person for this job. But if God called you to it, he'll see you through it. Just be faithful. One of the interesting facts that I came across as I studied about Noah's story is Noah's name literally means rest. But when you think about his story and what he was doing, there wasn't much rest, was there? 120 years of building a boat, cutting down trees, being a lumberjack. Not much rest in that. But what I found is that when you're faithfully obedient, it will lead to rest. It will lead to a harvest. It will lead to a blessing. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says this, The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. We must be reminded that God is faithful to us, and we must be faithful to him. We are called to be faithful just as he who has called us is faithful. If God had a plan to save the world, would you follow it? If he spoke to you today and said, I need you to build a boat, 
in the middle of nowhere, in a desert, would you do it? Could you have faithful obedience and follow the blueprints to save creation, humanity, the animals? Because what I'll tell you today is God still has a plan. And he's still calling us to do it. Humanity needs saving again. And God is calling. God has commanded us to build another ark. But this ark is not one made of wood. This ark is our life. One that exhibits the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Who is our instruction. Who is our blueprint our model to follow. The question is, will you faithfully obey? Will you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything Jesus has commanded us to? We are called. We have been given instructions. We've been given a blueprint, a model to follow. The question is, will you do it? Because oftentimes, oh, those small things get us, don't they? I don't have time to do that today, God. I don't have time to stop and, and witness to someone. I don't have time. Will you fill in the blank? God is still calling. My question is, can you hear him? Can you be faithful to him and the small and the big things. Because the small things lead to the big things. It builds. I led that group for years. Years. At West Florida High School. And one of those students became a missionary. Maybe that was the reason I did that. Just for that one And as I look back and I think about that experience and how frustrating at times it was, it's worth it. Because all those small things led to a big thing. And that student's now out doing big things in other countries. Because I was faithful in the small things. So today, as, as we close, I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we close in prayer. And I'm going to ask you to be faithful and to follow God's instructions, his blueprint, Jesus' command, so that we can save others. To be faithful in the small, so that we can be faithful in the big things. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the story of Noah. I thank you for his faithful obedience. What an example. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful just as Noah was. Lord, I know you call us every day. You call upon us to do certain things, and sometimes we hang up on you. Sometimes we ignore the phone call. Lord, I pray that we would hear your voice, your calling, your signs and wonders would begin to show and guide us through life as you call us. May we answer, and may we be faithful so that others may know you, so that others may know your faithfulness, so that they may know what you have done already for them. Lord, help us be faithful. May your spirit rest upon us and give us the courage we need to be faithful. Father, today, maybe some of us have had a calling on our lives and we've put it off. Or maybe some of us have had a calling and, and we go, God, that's not for me. I can't speak really well. I can't, I can't do that. Or God, maybe I'm, I'm too old to do that. That's not, that's not for me. Today, God is calling us. And with every eye closed and every head bowed, I just want you to commit. If God is calling you, raise your hand and commit to him to say, I will be faithfully obedient to you, Lord. When you call, I will go. When you say build a boat, I will build a boat. When you say love someone, I will love them. If you will be faithful today, just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God.
Father, we commit to you today to be faithful. Pour out your spirit on us. Move us. Stir us. So that others may know who you are. Lord, we pray these things in your name. Amen. I always like to close every service with a blessing. And I always tell folks you can't take much with your hands in your pocket. So if you would, just outstretch your hands and allow me to give you this blessing. May you be faithful in all things. And see that God is calling you to live as Jesus did so that others may know who he is. Go and be Jesus. You are dismissed.